Hey, how are you? Welcome back. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about spacesuits. You see, astronauts, when they're exploring in space, they're going to need to protect themselves from the space environment. Space is very hot sometimes and very cold. Space has no air, so we can't really breathe. So we're going to need to carry with us equipment that will keep us alive when we're exploring the moon and Mars and even beyond. One of the tools that we use are spacesuits. These spacesuits are like a small spaceship. They have the air that we need to breathe. They keep us at a comfortable temperature, and they allow us to work and live on the surface of worlds that are yet to be explored. Speaking of exploration, let's get ready to explore. Hey, I've got a special friend here, and we've got to get our special friend ready for space. You want me to introduce our special friend? Here we go. Here he is. Yes. Now, this is a bear, and this bear has got to get ready for space. What do you think our bear is missing? You're right. Our bear is missing a spacesuit. We're going to have to suit up our bear for space. Now, when suiting up our bear for space, we're going to need a very special suit, a space suit for our bear. Spacesuits come with different parts, and all those parts must work together, and nothing can go wrong to keep our bear safe in space. Let's take a look at some of the parts that go into making a, a suit for our bear. Now, one thing that we're going to need is we're going to need a part of a suit that goes around the bear's body. Our suit has to keep the air inside and has to be very, very strong so that no holes can let any air out. So our suit has to protect our bear and keep the bear warm on the inside and keep the cold and the vacuum of space on the outside. So we're going to put on a, a suit here, get ready, and I've got our bear suiting up, getting ready for space. Oh, our bear is ready, zipping up the suit, and now looks like our bear is just about ready. Whoa, there's something, something our bear is, is missing. What do you think it might be? Oh, yeah, our, our, our bear definitely needs something to cover its head. And, and let's get a, a helmet on our bear. And our bear is ready for space. Check him out. There he is. He has his helmet, and he has its suit. You think our bear is ready for space now? Hey, welcome back. Now, it turns out that our bear isn't in a real spacesuit. But let me show you what a real spacesuit looks like. This is a real spacesuit. This is actually a spacesuit that was worn by Buzz Aldrin, the second man that was on the moon. Notice the helmet and the boots and the rest of the suit. Let's talk about the parts of a suit because it turns out that a spacesuit is made of many different layers. Now, the layer that's right next to your skin, that is a liner that protects your skin from the rest of the spacesuit and also makes sure that it can transport some of that sweat away from your body. Next, there's a liquid coolant layer. Now, it turns out that being in a spacesuit, can generate a lot of heat. Your body doing all this work in space can generate heat that traps inside your spacesuit. 
This liquid coolant layer has a hose, and we run all this fluid through the hose to take heat away from your body, cooling you down. Now, our next layer is a really important layer. This yellow layer right here is called the bladder. The bladder is actually like a balloon, like this, and it's trapping the air inside, the air that you need to breathe. Now, being in a balloon can be really hard, and, it, and it's hard to move around. And so it turns out that we've got to specially structure this balloon with places that can bend at the elbows and bend at the wrist so that we can actually move around in our spacesuit to live and work in space. Now, after that layer, though, we've got a layer that's going to hold the shape of that balloon that you're in so that it doesn't blow up. Very important. Now, we're going to need to protect that layer, that bladder layer, from anything that might puncture a hole. So our next layer is called the thermal protection and micrometeoroid layer. Let me explain what that means. It turns out that we have to protect ourselves from the sun. The sun has a lot of light and energy, and so we're going to need to protect you from that light and energy and protect the rest of the spacesuit underneath. We've got this layer that's going to be part of that layer, the thermal protection layer, and then on top of that black layer, we've got all these very shiny reflective layers. They shine sunlight away from your spacesuit. And then finally, on top of all those reflective layers made of mylar, we've got this, the micrometeoroid protection layer. It's designed to protect the rest of the spacesuits from the micrometeoroids in space. Did you know that space isn't really empty? There are tiny little particles shooting around through space, and they could actually poke a hole in your spacesuit. We don't want that. That's what this layer is for. This layer is also white to reflect sunlight, to keep the astronaut cool. Now, we're not done yet. It turns out there are a couple of things that we're going to need. We're going to need some boots, especially if you're going to be walking on the moon or even on Mars. These boots have to be really thick to protect you from the surface because the surface can be really, really hot or really, really cold. You've got to protect your feet. And we have to protect your hands. You're going to be wearing gloves. And these special gloves are designed in such a way that you can move your fingers to do work. Exactly. And then finally, we're going to need a helmet. That's right, a helmet. This helmet is on your head. And you can see through it with a visor, and it traps the air inside. It's very hard to look around inside a helmet, and so sometimes astronauts wear mirrors on their arms so they can see behind them. All of this has to work together to keep an astronaut safe. Thank you, Ricky. Let's see what NASA has got in mind with the future of spacesuits. Hi, I'm Amy Ross. I'm a spacesuit engineer. I design spacesuits like these. This is Ask NASA. I'm here to answer your questions. For the Artemis missions, astronauts wore spacesuits like these, and they'll be able to walk on the moon in a spacesuit like this. The XEMU stands for Exploration Extravehicular Mobility Unit, so XEMU. On the front of the suit here, this is called the display and control unit, and this is how they control the backpack or life support system of the spacesuit. The new generation of spacesuits, or the XEMU, has a lot more mobility, so they're able to do the science we need them to do, such as geology, pick up rock samples, and also interact with rovers. But can she dab? Yes, she can. She can also floss. There are new technologies in the suit, so we're implementing new materials, and we have more bearings in the suit, and that allows her to move better. We make spacesuits for humans. They will be wearing the suit when we send the first woman to the moon and the next man in 2024. Yes, the layers of the spacesuit protect against all the harsh conditions on the lunar surface, including moon dust. So the boots are very different, more like a good hiking boot, and they have adjustment for better fit. Donning is a term we use for putting on the spacesuit. Doffing is taking it off. 
So why does NASA have two Artemis spacesuits? This is the Orion Crew Survival Suit, and it's different than the XEME that you just saw. And Dustin's going to tell you all about it. Thanks, Amy. This is the Orion Crew Survival Suit. This suit is worn during launch and entry of Orion. This suit is also designed for contingency operations. If we had an emergency in deep space, the crew could actually survive in this suit and live for up to six days. Is this spacesuit comfortable? Oh, the spacesuit is very comfortable. It's multiple layers of fabric, but they're all very form-fitting and tailored specifically to the occupant. It fits perfectly to the person and also perfectly to the seat that they sit in. So, why is the spacesuit orange? Well, <laughs> the original versions of the suit were actually blue, and we actually egressed into the water, fancy word for getting out of the vehicle, and we practiced our search and rescue ops. Orange is the most visible color for search and rescue crews coming to retrieve the crew. Hey, what's that on your leg? Oh, you mean these? These are actually oxygen bottles. So if we were to have to disconnect from the Orion capsule, they provide us about 30 minutes of air if an emergency was to occur on orbit. Hey, is that a space fanny pack under your arm? Oh, this? This is actually my life preserver unit in case I had to jump out of Orion into the water. I can pull these tabs and deploy it. So everything about this spacesuit really is built for survival. What's the spacesuit material experiment? We're sending some spacesuit materials to Mars to test them in the Martian environment. This experiment will show how our helmet materials and our soft goods hold up in the Mars atmosphere. Our spacesuits really are a spacecraft, human shaped, that protect our astronauts. These are the next generation Artemis spacesuits that will go to the moon and on to Mars. Oh, that was so cute. I loved it so much. <laughs> You know, working in a spacesuit can be really, really hard. Here's an activity to see if you've got the right stuff to be an astronaut working in a spacesuit. Now, one of the hardest things to do is to, well, work with your hands. Your hands have to be protected with space gloves. But let's do a little activity. I've got a challenge for you, and you're going to need some oven mitts and a lot of blocks. Maybe you can try to make something. It's kind of hard working with space gloves and trying to make something, but maybe if you practice enough, you might be able to, to make something. Oh, hey, here we go. I made a duck. Let's see if we can do something else. Hey, Commander Day, what you doing over there? Hey, I was just telling our audience uh, how we actually have to work with space gloves and, and how difficult it can be. So I, I told them an activity that they can do at home. You just got to find some oven mitts and maybe oh. some blocks. Well, that looks like a lot of fun. Can I try? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Let's see what you, get, uh, you can make. It's going to be pretty cool, I bet. Okay. Wow, this is kind of complicated. It, it is. It can be very hard. Astronauts have the same challenge, and that's why they have to practice a lot. They're working in an environment that needs that spacesuit, and so it can be kind of hard to work with a spacesuit and the gloves, so they need a lot of practice. And that will help them when they're actually in space to actually do their work. What, what are you... What are you doing? I don't know. I'm just trying to build something. Okay. It looks like I made the letter U. <laughs> wow, that was really entertaining. That was. I, I'm going to go home and do it again. Yep. Do you ever wonder how big the Earth and the Moon really are. We're on the Earth, so it's really hard to tell sometimes. And the Moon seems so far away. How would you show the difference between the size of the Earth and the size of the Moon? Well, I've got an activity for you, and, and I'll show you a little bit about how the Moon and the Earth are different in size. First, you're going to need a basketball and a piece of string. Take the string and wrap it around the basketball's middle so that it actually is the same size as how big around the basketball is. 
We call that the circumference of the basketball, how big around the basketball is. And now we have a string. Now what can we do with this string? Well, it turns out that we can use this string to figure out how big the moon is in comparison. See, if we have a string that's this size, that goes once around the Earth, here in this case, once around our basketball Earth, we can take the same string and move it around and wrap it around a moon four times. Let's find out if, if we've got a moon that's just the right size. Oh, here's one. Let's see how many times it can go around. Once, twice, mm, this is too big. How about this one here? Oh, that looks once, twice, three times, four, five, six, seven. Mm. This is too small. Oh, I've got one here. How about this? I can go once, twice, three times, and four. Oh, this is how big the moon would be in comparison to a, an earth that were shrunk down to the size of a basketball. That's how big the moon and the earth would be if they were right in front of you and you were big enough to hold them in your hand. See how small the moon is compared to our basketball earth? That's how big the earth and the moon are. You can try it. Find yourself a basketball and some string. Now there's one more thing you could do. It turns out that if you wanted to figure out how far apart the Earth and the Moon would be in space, you need another string. And this string goes around the Earth once, twice, three times, four times, five times, six times, seven times, eight times, nine, and 10. You would need a string that goes around the earth 10 times to equal the distance between the earth and the moon, really far apart. You can try that at home. All right, now astronaut Ricky, we are now looking for lunar samples to bring back to Earth. Uh, these samples will tell us a little bit about the formation of the moon, and it will probably give us a story as to how the moon was formed. We've got a couple of there, rocks that we're not, looking for. There's not quite a lot up here. It kind of empty. Yes, I know. It, it is kind of empty that it, you're on the moon. There is no life on the moon, and you won't find very much other than rocks. All right. I'm going to take a look around and see what I can come up with. Um, let's, let's take a look. Just talk to the kids while I'm searching. Okay. I'll let you know if I find something. All right. Great. Over. Well, astronaut Ricky right now is on the moon searching for some moon rocks. There are many different types of moon rocks that are on the surface, but I've got two types that there are found here on Earth. The Earth and the moon do share similar types of rocks, so if we find similar types of rocks that we find here on Earth on the moon, that can give us clues as to how those rocks formed and what it was like in the past. Two types of rocks that we're looking for on the moon are rocks called basalts. Uh, they're very dark rocks, and they tell us about the volcanic history of the moon. But the rocks we're really looking for are these bright white colored rocks. It's called a northosite. Uh, this is the hey, type Commander of- Hey, Commander Dave. Oh, wait, one second. Sorry to interrupt, but I think I found something here. I'm not sure if this is what you want. Okay, can you describe it, please? Well, it, 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 it's round. It's orange, and it looks like if I threw it hard enough, it would 
bounce. I, I, I don't think that's a moon rock. I, I, I think that sounds like a basketball. I don't know. I, uh, well, it, 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 it's up here. So uh, if you want, I can bring that or I can keep looking. I, I would keep looking. We're, we're looking All for right, it. So I'm going to just keep looking and, and see what else I find. Oh, wait. Oh, oh wait. I, I think I got something here. What, what, did, what did you find? Well, it, it, it looks like a basket. It's uh, brown. It's got wicker. Um, that's not a moon rock. No. No. No, this, 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 it's not. I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it now, and yeah, clearly it's not a moon rock. I, I would put that down. I, I think we're going to have to really stick to the mission, and we're looking for moon rocks. I don't know what those things are. Oh, oh, psh, wait, wait. I, yeah, I, oh, uh, I think I got it now. Yeah, this, this clearly, definitely, most positively... Yes, this is a moon rock. Okay. I am going to take this with me. Do you know what color it is? Um, I can't tell because it's kind of dark, but when I bring it back to Earth, we'll be able to look at it. Great, and okay. And see the color. All right, astronaut Ricky, we're looking forward to getting that lunar sample back. Whew, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad I made it back in time. Hi, I'm Jacob Bleacher. I'm a geologist. That means I study rocks and dirt on the Earth and planets. This is Ask NASA. I'm here to answer your questions. What is unique about the surface of the moon? Well, the moon is quite unique from the Earth. It has no atmosphere. There's no air to breathe. What that means is that the processes that have occurred on the moon are all preserved there in the rocks. For instance, if you look at the moon from the Earth, you may see circles. Those circles are impact craters. Let me show you. Except, making craters is really dirty business. I need my crater making poncho. Now we're ready. Let's pretend this is the surface of the moon. It looks a lot like this. That's one crater. But the surface of the moon has many more. Oh, that was a good one. On the moon, these craters have formed over time, and as you saw, material from each crater buries the previous ones, making this very rough terrain. In that terrain, at the pole, there are some craters that we believe have water ice trapped there, and they never see the sunlight. That's good for science, and could also be a resource that helps our astronauts survive. Why study moon rocks? Well, besides the fact that rocks are awesome, each rock is kind of like a person. It has its own fingerprint. We talked about impact craters. That's recorded in the rocks. Whether or not ice or water has been near there, that's recorded in the rocks. It tells us the history of the moon. What tools will astronauts use to explore the moon? Well, hopefully we'll have plenty of tools for them. For instance, something like this. This is a hammer like you would use here on Earth. It's a geologist's best friend. It helps us to break up rocks and select samples. You could also use things like rakes and shovels to help us find the right kind of material to bring home. Eventually, we could be using tools more like this. This tool is an X-ray fluorescence spectrometer, or XRF. An XRF basically shoots X-rays at a rock and then detects what comes back. And as I talked about before, rocks have unique fingerprints. This helps us to determine what that fingerprint is. Our astronauts will also use rovers, like this model that you can see right here. These vehicles are designed so that they can help us move around on the surface. Hey, astronauts aren't the only ones that get to wear suits. I'm Commander Dave. I'm actually in this suit. It's a clean room suit. We're in the Lunar Sample Laboratory. This is where we have to actually store moon rocks to keep them from being touched by human hands and have to keep them safe from oxygen that can alter the chemistry of these rocks. In the Lunar Sample Lab, we have glove boxes so we can study and manipulate the rocks. And as we study them, we learn more about the moon itself. 
But remember, we've got two different kinds of rocks we're looking for. White rocks that are called anorthosites. These are some of the oldest rocks that are found on the moon. And these darker rocks, called basalts, they tell us about the volcanic history of the moon. But these two rocks here are earth rocks. I happen to have a moon rock right here. This is a moon rock. And it actually came from the moon and brought here by astronauts in 1972. It is a dark rock, and it tells us that this rock is a volcanic rock. Volcanic rocks here on Earth, well, they're not very old. But this rock right here is super old. This rock is almost 3.7 billion years old, older than almost all the rocks on Earth. That tells us that the moon's surface is really, really old. And that was a huge surprise. There are lots of stories that our rocks can tell us, but the rocks that came from the moon, well, they're special. Being brought here by astronauts, we only have about 800 pounds of rocks that were collected from these astronauts. But maybe sometime in the future, you might be able to go out there and get some more moon rocks for us. Keep studying hard and keep exploring, and before you know it, you may be one of the next generation of astronauts on the surface of the moon, and if you can bring the lunar samples back here to our Lunar Sample Laboratory, think of what the stories those rocks can tell. Hi. Wow, we've had such a great adventure today. We learned about spacesuits, we learned about the moon, and we even went to the moon and collected some moon rocks brought them back to Earth, and you even got a chance to see a real moon rock collected by an astronaut on a journey to the moon and brought it back here to Earth. You know what that means? That means that we have to continue exploring. We want you to study really hard, work really hard, and eventually, maybe someday, you may be the next generation of astronauts that can bring back more samples from the moon. And we're not stopping at the moon. We're going to the moon, Mars, and beyond. I'm Dave Mestry, Commander Dave of the Discovery Museum and the Henry B. DuPont Planetarium. If you want some more information about any of our programs at the Discovery Museum, check out our website, www.discoverymuseum.org. This is Commander Dave, signing off.